Welcome to Dr. Lottie Science with Soul, the podcast that transcends the boundaries between science and spirituality. Prepare to be uplifted, transformed, and awakened to create a path to healing your own life physically, emotionally, and spiritually by bridging the gap between science and soul. Welcome back to another episode of Dr. Lottie Science with Soul. My guest today is Peter Canova, who is highly successful, a multilingual international businessman who, after a series of life-changing spiritual experiences, began studying and writing on spirituality and consciousness. In his book, Quantum Spirituality, the renowned linguist, historian, and spiritual philosopher elucidates the profound and astonishing alignment between the ancient Gnostic teachings and the modern sciences of quantum physics and philosophy. He is also the author of the 25-time award-winning First Souls trilogy and has contributed to the popular Chicken Soup for the Soul series. He hosts a podcast, Quantum Spirituality, on Dream Vision 7 Radio Network. Welcome, Peter. It's such an honor to have you as a guest today. Very nice to be with you. And I just finished reading your book, Quantum Spirituality. So I'm really excited to have you as a guest today uh, because I had two near-death out-of-body experiences myself. And when I stood in that light, I knew that one thing I knew was that we come from the light, we return to the light, and we carry the light within us. And listening to your book, I was like, wow, this guy gets it. <laughs> so really excited because you you sort of put the puzzle pieces together. So let's start with, um, have you talk a little bit about what is the nature of consciousness and the force that formed creation? Well, you know, as you mentioned, light has very much to do with it. Uh, consciousness... Uh, I would define consciousness as an intelligent energy that expresses itself through the medium of light. And um, light essentially creates our universe. I mean, without light, we wouldn't have the perception of a three-dimensional universe. It's, it's the light that reflects off of objects that allows us to perceive them as objects. And we don't really perceive those objects out there, incidentally. We perceive them actually in the back of our brains. Uh, the light uh, reflects off the, you know, comes into the rods and cones of our eyes. And the images that we actually see are really uh, light images in, in the, uh, the back of our brain, which has led many to speculate, is there any such thing as a really and truly an objective reality out there? Or are we basically seeing a cosmic light show of, of, uh, of uh, you know, reflected or transmitted images? So, um, but consciousness really uh, is the basis for everything that is. Uh, materialist science has uh, had a different view, uh, which is what I call the bottom-up view of life, that somehow life is the product of a random collision of particles that, uh, of, of organic particles that somehow, you know, formed more complex structures and everything. Big problem with that is nobody's ever, ever been able to prove how organic matter developed out of inorganic matter, which came first. Uh, so it's a, actually a very poor explanation. Um, science tends to sweep a lot of things under the rug with some you know, convenient little notions, but it's uh, far more plausible uh, to understand the paradoxes of life when you really view it as a top-down situation where consciousness essentially projected uh, everything that you know, we, we view as reality in the universe. Right. So consciousness. Um, so how would you describe, you know, what is what is consciousness or what is source? Well, source is so what I what I call source in my book is the one unified consciousness is the one single consciousness. And incidentally, we are all part of that consciousness. Um, you know, in my book, not only approaches things from a scientific point of view, but also from the point of view of traditional mystical religion. Uh, or I should say spirit, spirituality, not religion. There's a big distinction there. And uh, the spiritual texts, which are mystic Judeo-Christian texts, Hindu, really most of the mystical teachings of the world's major spiritual and religious traditions tell us that we you know, proceeded from a single source and that this source 
projected its consciousness out into different points of consciousness. Essentially, it emanated the universe. It emanated uh, thinking beings rather than created them. So the difference between emanation and creation is creation is something different from its maker. So the puppet Pinocchio was different from its maker Geppetto. Well, that's not really the way it works in a true spiritual sense. In a true spiritual sense, we are actual projections of the essence of this source itself, albeit in a diluted and limited form. Uh, and that um, through this succession, or, or uh, I would say um, descent of consciousness, the source was able to experience itself in all kinds of different vibrational realms which normally it wouldn't be able to do as the source itself. So the source was kind of on a little bit of an experiential expedition. And we you, we might consider ourselves possibly the bottom rung of that ladder of experience, which is consciousness in physical form. So how did we get, I mean, so we're in this 3D reality where we are we are matter, but how did we become matter if we're you know how do, how does the how does how does matter form from the energy from the consciousness which is just energy how did we then become these things <laughs> or matter that we can touch and feel and yeah um well it's really very interesting because one of the startling parallels that i noticed between modern quantum physical theories and ancient spiritual wisdom has very much to do with that the transition from spiritual energy to matter. And, um, you know, in the Gnostic text, uh, the central Gnostic myth is about an aspect of the source named Sophia. And Sophia means uh, wisdom in Greek. Uh, wisdom is actually a, uh, a spiritual figure all throughout the Bible. The uh, Or Sophia, I should say, is actually a spiritual figure all throughout the Bible, particularly the Old Testament, only we don't know it because it uses uh, the the word uh, wisdom, which is really what, Sof what Sophia was the translation of the Greek Sophia. And um, it says in the Bible that uh, I was there from the beginning. I am co-temporal, co co-terminus with, with God, which means that it was a high aspect of the source. Now, in the traditional text, the, 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 the Gnostic myths are very interesting because they say that Sophia seeking wisdom and wisdom after all is only gained through experience right you don't just sit there in a, in a vacuum and gain wisdom you have to go out and stick your neck out there uh to experience things in order to gain wisdom so sophia looks outside of the sphere that was uh, of the immediate sphere of consciousness what they what they might call the heavenly sphere of consciousness and she looks outside at this unformed area called chaos in the text which again completely um, is in concert with current um, quantum thinking because they really call the quantum energetic field that field that precedes matter that's out there as a as a as a as a wave uh, they call that chaos they call that the area of probability or the, the area of possibility because it's unformed it's it's as yet unformed it's like potential matter and potential so Sophia projects herself into chaos and lo and behold, what it says is that her high energy gets starts to attract particles or like virtual particles that are already in chaos that the, they call proto matter. Now that's amazing. Think of this: three thousand years ago, they used a term that completely describes what virtual virtual particles are: proto matter, that is just preceding matter, a state just preceding physical matter. These, these virtual particles swarm around Sophia and they slow her energy down. And she starts to morph into something more dense, which is matter. And she cries out to heaven, save me from this matter that I am becoming. I am becoming as lead. I am becoming solid. Save me from this matter. Now, what's startling about this is that you may have heard of something called the God particle. And the God particle was a holy grail uh, of uh, quantum physics that was theorized for about half a century until finally they found it in 2012 lurking in the Hadron Particle Collider over there in the CERN laboratories uh, beneath Switzerland. And they discovered the God particle. And the God what the God particle does is our universe is surrounded by a field called the Higgs field. And within the Higgs field, 
there, which is basically chaos, the vacuum, within this field, there are these virtual particles called Higgs bosons. What the Higgs bosons do is when energy enters into our universe at a high vibration, the Higgs bosons flock to them and surround them like the protomatter surrounded Sophia and slows the energy down. And it slows it down to the point where it becomes matter. Because matter, after all, is really just energy slowed in vibration. It's light energy slowed in vibration. So you see what, what, they, what they were describing in the Gnostic text was the action of the God particle converting matter, energy into matter, like two or 3,000 years before the Higgs boson was even uh, even discovered. So you ask, how do we you know, pass from this state? Essentially, we vibrated down to a level that was so dense and so low that it took on the characteristics of solidity. And uh, we were able to project consciousness, consciousness into those solid forms. So now we're this solid uh, form over here as humans having this earthly experience. But then when we leave this earthly realm and our body dies, um, do we then go back to that light, you know, the lightweight form of existing as in spirit form? Yeah, well, uh, we do. But whether or not you sort of stay in that form or you return in physical form is dependent on a number of different different factors. Uh, um, the, all the texts would say that, look, if, uh, if you don't essentially have a transformational experience while you're still in the body and recognize, uh, or if you don't, let, let's say, if you don't experience higher consciousness while you're still in the body and recognize the original source of your being, uh, you have a pretty fair chance of uh, reincarnating in physical form until you get it right. And then what do you think happens after we get it right? Well, it seems to me that there are many levels of reality. Uh, you know, I, I kind of liken it to the layers of an onion or planets revolving around a sun, uh, concentric layers of, of reality. And these layers of reality may not be so much like physical spaces as much as they are uh, vibrational points, vibrational areas of consciousness. So that doesn't necessarily mean that we might be in a physical form. Now, we might be in some other physical form or near physical form, like an etheric form, or we may be at a higher level of vibration where there really are no physical bodies, where it's really pure thought. Uh, I do think that there are all levels of consciousness until you know you really <laughs> kind of get up into the upper echelons there so um you know where do where do we where would you go where would i go as individuals i can't really say that i don't know but i do believe that what we will do is traverse different dimensions of a vibrational or conscious experience mm -hmm. uh so do you believe that um there are parallel universes or multi-universes can we well, have yeah i think can we have a life somewhere else at the same time? Yeah, I do think we are multidimensional beings. So I think that somewhere uh, in other dimensions, uh, there is our, our, where, where our, our central soul consciousness resides. We have kind of dreamed ourselves down here. And uh, I do believe that we can exist on multiple levels of reality. Uh, so, I mean, you know, I, again, I, I, I don't... Uh, I mean, I've been over to some of these, I've, I've gotten messages, I've gotten a guidance from some of these other dimensions. I've even visualized them sometime, but I can't exactly say, have I pinpointed exactly where my consciousness resides and, you know, like geographically pinned it down? No, nothing like that. But I am quite sure from the experiences that I've had in my life, like you said, you had near-death experiences. Well, fortunately, I haven't had one of those yet, but um, I have... Uh, gone over to the other side and I know I have because I've received information that I've used in this plane of existence which has been predictive which has actually saved my life on occasions which has provided me information that um, eventually would come to pass like in my books uh, a lot of geopolitical predictions that uh, I wrote about in my books actually came into reality and they've wrote, written some magazine articles about that so you know uh, I know for people listening here if you haven't had those experiences it sounds a little abstract but if you have had the experiences you own them it's the difference between somebody telling you that fire burns and putting your hand in the fire. Absolutely. 
I've had many of those experiences myself. So because after my near-death experience, I became a medium. I hear the spirit world, remote viewing, uh, knowing things before they happen, etc. Yeah. Right. Uh, so I, I'm right there. I, I, I'm right I understand there that. I, I understand <laughs> what you're saying. Now, yeah. If we can, so here we are having these warnings. Okay, watch out for this accident. You know, take this road or avoid that. Um, how can we see something that hasn't happened yet? How can we how can we get a warning about the future or know something about the future and then make take the right action? Are, well, are you asking what's the nuts and bolts behind it or how can people get to the point where they have those experiences? Because those are two different things. Uh, let's start with the nuts and bolts. Like, how can we how can we access that? I mean, we are we're experiencing time as linear moving forward, but we can tap into a future event that has not yet happened. How can we do that and get warnings about that? Yeah, well, I, I'm at higher levels. I'm not so sure time is actually linear. Uh, I think, uh, you know, they're certainly at, at the highest dimensions. I think things kind of, things kind of unfold in, you know, uh, just a, <laughs> a way that past, present and future are merged, but, um, it would seem to me, I mean, it, the nuts and bolts is a, is a little bit of a tougher issue to describe rather than actually experience itself. Uh, I can only, um, you know, take a guess at this. I, I think that. We have had experiences that really give us pretty much almost infinite knowledge and it's locked somewhere inside us because we experienced these things already at another level. So, you know, for instance, I believe in that hermetic adage that as it is above, so it is below. Uh, to me, that's one of the most profound wisdom sayings ever, because what it really says is that this lower level of reality that we're in is a reflection of higher levels of reality. So for instance, the functioning of a computer, how did we invent a computer? Well, I don't think that happened out of thin air. I think it models the way the human brain works, and I think it models the way the universe works, quantum energies work. So essentially, when we learn something or experience something or have these experiences, I think it's more of a remembrance rather than a learning. And I think essentially when we have those feelings, we're remembering something, you know, don't go there, don't do that. Perhaps we're remembering something that, that, that you know, has really already taken place at some other level of, of reality. Maybe we're having a little bit of a breakthrough to that simultaneous um, temporal existence where, you know, something has already happened and we're just glomming onto it yeah i would agree with that um one of the things i learned during my near-death experience was that on the other side when you're out of your body there is no time so you have access to past present and future it's kind of all the same but then you come back into this dimension and now you know time sort of moves forward because that's how we experience time being in the physical dimension but so if you have you know, so what you're saying is that the, when we tap into those future events or we get warned, don't go down that road because there's a truck that's going to run you over. Um, we're we're tapping into that other side that doesn't have time because it's already there. Is that what you're saying? That's what I'm saying. And I'm saying essentially what we're doing in this more limited level of consciousness is having a resonance or a remembrance of that. Because, uh, you know, in all honesty, like I say, it, it, at some level, we're all infinite beings and we pretty much have a handle on on a lot of things. But yeah, in order to experience three dimensional physical reality in a physical body, we have to limit our consciousness to such a great extent that these other things to most of us are not available. Now, that doesn't mean that we can't have breakthroughs or glimpses. It's sort of like having, you know, living behind a curtain or a veil and every so often you can kind of just, you know, crack it enough to see, hey, what's going on there on the other side? And that's where we get, you know, these, these things that people call psychic or spiritual experiences. I couldn't agree more. So I mean, I always say like, once you're back in the body, it's like you can't access that information that when you're outside the body, you, you have access to all of it. It's like the the iron curtain came down and, you have no access to it because it's, we're in the physical to have some physical experience. Well, you know, I think it's, I often liken it to that old Star Trek series where uh, the crew had the holodeck where they could go for recreation and the holodeck could project them anywhere at any time. Uh, and they could actually immerse themselves. They could actually participate in that 
as if they were one of the characters in the holodeck. And sometimes it got so real that the characters forget who the programmer was. So we're the programmers, you know, who programmed ourselves here and we've forgotten, you know, we did such a good job of it. We've forgotten who the pro we, we, we think we are the character and forgotten we're the programmer. All right. So are you basically saying that we have a soul contract that we wrote the script for and someday we forget it and we come here to have some kind of experience? Uh, well, I don't know if I'd describe it as a contract because that sounds very specific. I, I would say that, um, yeah, certainly we came here. We we came here uh, as an experience. You know, if you really go back, I'm not actually sure we were really meant to be here. There's a, in my mind, and especially reading the text and, and you know, um, uh, people like the readings of Edgar Casey and and my third book of my trilogy is actually um, uh, you know kind of based on this that um, we were really meant to be spiritual helpers in guiding the creation and uh, instead of um, guiding the river uh, the flow of things in the river we jumped inside and tried to change the course of the river. And uh, I'm not sure we were, we were really meant to do that. And I think there's an ambiguity even in the ancient text as to whether this was all a um, foreseen act of the source or, or just a mistake on our part. Well, I'd have to say it was foreseen because the, the source probably knows everything. But... Um, you know, there there was a the, the ancient text really echoed this whole thing that we may be alien, you know, to this world and possibly didn't belong here or you know to meddle in it the way that we that we have. But I think the impetus of the desire certainly was for the soul to have experience. Because think of it for a second: if you're an immaterial energy, an immaterial consciousness, how interesting would it be to be in a physical form where you perceive the the warmth of the sun, what it tastes. What food tastes like, what it's like to touch another another being other than yourself, you know, in a, in a physical way. So I can imagine the temptations of physicality, you know, were quite great. And I and I really think it, 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 it when perhaps when we first entered uh, this uh, sphere, that we were able to project in and out at will at some point. Um, really, I guess you would say we had godlike powers at that point. But then I think what happened was we started to dwell in physical form a little too long and identify reality with boundaries of our skin and forget where we really came from. I love that. So true, because that's all we really know, being in this physical form. So what is our reality? Is it just, are we living some kind of holographic movie? I think so. Yeah, I I, I think the world is definitely... Um, likened unto a giant hologram I, I think the matrix was not really too far off although where i disagree with the matrix is i don't think it's all done by machines and ai you know somewhere up there that uh you know has us like puppets i, I think we're we're <laughs> i think we're basically the ones that are pulling our own strings but yeah i mean it it has all the um uh it has all the the, the reality here has all the makings of a holographic uh projection and you know um in quantum physics, there is a phenomenon called quantum entanglement, and it's where particles can instantaneously detect one another at the equivalent of millions of light years apart. So it would be in a way like if there was a version of you here on Earth and a version of you on Mars, and I pinched the version on Earth and the version on Mars at the same time went, ouch. Well, how, how does that happen? Well, they puzzled over that because there's no apparent exchange of energy it's not like they're connected by fiber optics or or a, a, a tin can with string on it or anything like that um and uh they started to theorize well you know maybe just maybe uh this whole uh, vision of what we're experiencing here is a whole instead of the sum of the parts and and so th these things we're able to experience these things and we have the basis of telepathy we're able to to you know tune into somebody else's his thoughts or feelings or something else because we really in all truth are part of a whole and we only perceive ourselves as the part but the thing about a hologram is you can slice it and dice it in any way you want but each little minute piece of that hologram contains the image of the whole within it so then 
from that point on, there was a whole body of, of, of theory called the holographic universe theory that started to develop over time among, in, in physics. You know, that's really, I mean, entanglement, uh, I work with it myself, but I do ancestral healing, which is really a form of counseling. But you see that entanglement, the quantum physics entang entanglement with the ancestors. So it's really interesting because it's, we are so much more entangled than we are led to believe, because I think we have this illusion of that we are separate, but we are really entangled with all the other people we come in contact with. It doesn't matter if it's people, plants, animals, the world. We're, we're part of, like you said, we're part of that whole, we're all one in the end. And it's all, yeah. right? There's, there, yeah, oh, yeah. I mean, and, and, you know, I know that for a fact, because, like, I, I remember, um, so uh, I, I had a, a lady that I was going out with at the time. And um, she gave me an object off her mantle. And immediately I started getting visions. And I said, okay, this was a, a makeup or peace offering from you and another boyfriend. And I said, uh, I said, you got, he was a, I said, he, I think he may have been a skier. And I also think he badly injured his knee because I saw his knee kind of rotating around loosely like that. And, uh, and she said, that's exactly, you know, what happened. So, you know, by touching an object that both of them had touched, I was able to pick up a history there. Now, that's an, that is an example of entanglement. You would call that psychic perception, whatever you want to call it, but it, it's an example of entanglement. Right, exactly. Psychometry. Uh, you can touch an object and then you get the information about the person that had that object or touched that object, right? I mean, it's right. fascinating because we're, su we're such amazing creatures if we could just have everybody tap into this right we are yeah I, I mean we, you know the thing about it is that religion has painted us a dismal picture i mean religion has told us that we were like these um separate creations from the creator and we were like these little wind-up dolls that were created out of the dust of the earth and they you know sent us down here bouncing around this lunatic asylum and oh by the way we ticked off god right from the beginning by being born and forever trying to get back in the you know his good graces so you know the the mystical or spiritual picture is no you know there's no separation between you and the creator and therefore there really is no sin there's forgetting maybe the biggest sin was forgetting or the biggest sin was and incidentally the english word sin comes its root means off the mark OK, so we just like Sophia, we went off the mark. We vectored away from the central source to experience reality. We went off the mark and, uh, you know, we 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 essentially separated ourselves in some ways. But 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 there's never really a true separation. It's only apparent. So, you know, religion has not done us a good turn by um, really presenting this low low picture of what humanity is about humanity really is the bridge between the spiritual or the energetic dimensions and the physical dimension and i i say you know in in my books that we are the fingers of god touching the face of this earth and our our goal our purpose is to experience the material and 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 uh, to uh, spiritualize the material and bring the experience of material back to spirit so we, we're we're kind of like the the two way um, the two way tunnel that all these energies pass through. Now you, you talk about the Gnostics um, that knew all this stuff like three thousand years ago. Who who were the Gnostics, and what were their teachings? Yeah, the well, <clears throat> in the um, ancient world there were a series of mystery schools that stretch from India to the British Isles. And they essentially taught the same thing with little different nuances because of the varying cultures and times involved. But essentially there was a mystical wisdom back at that time. They call it the perennial philosophy today, the philosophy, the, the, the wisdom that just won't quit, that just keeps coming back. And the Gnostics were very much the recipients of uh, many of these streams of thought because they were centered in Alexandria, Egypt. And Alexandria at the time was the intellectual capital of the world. And we know, uh, have examples of, you know, Hindu teachers there and uh, Persian Zoroastrian teachers. Uh, the Gnostics um, inherited these traditions along with uh, Hellenic mystical thought and uh, even the Jewish Kabbalah. 
uh, Egyptian Hermeticism. All these were very close uh, in a, a, around uh, the the uh, the city of Alexandria, and the Gnostics were uh, kind of the recipients of all these streams of mystical wisdom. And the reason why I center on the Gnostics is that because of all the traditions, they were the most clearly scientific of everybody. I mean, they're, they're they, when Carl Jung read uh, the Gnostic text, he said, finally, I found people who understand me and they were there before me. So, you know, the Gnostics really kind of predated spiritual uh, uh, Jungian depth psychology and quantum physics and many other uh, modern sciences in their texts. And that's what attracted me to them. And the, uh, the Gnostics actually became the first Christians because when Jesus of Nazareth started his ministry, they recognized that he was teaching a Gnostic message and they became amongst the very first Christians. And we know that um, Jesus had two teachings, essentially. There was an inner mystical teaching and then there was an outer teaching for the masses. The reason we know that is because it says it right in the Bible. It says, unto the disciples, he gave the keys to the kingdom of heaven, unto those without he taught in parables. We also have uh, testimonies from the early church fathers, like bishops Clement of Alexandria uh, and Origen, Bishop Origen, uh, affirming the fact that Jesus had a mystical teaching that was not taught to anybody but the elect for fear that the teachings would be bastardized and misunderstood, which is exactly what happened anyway. But um, the Gnostics were essentially the, the 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 recipients of this mystical tradition. They already they already were onto it before Jesus came along. Only he was maybe the highest expression of it. So um, essentially, two churches existed in early Christianity side by side. There was the Orthodox Church or the Outer Church, and there was the Gnostic Church or the Inner Mystical Church, and they coexisted for a couple of centuries until the Orthodox Church, um, you know, really started developing a lot of dogmas and hierarchies and, you know, getting subject to different political agendas. And uh, eventually they exterminated the Gnostics because the Gnostics were saying, we don't need priests, we don't need your hierarchy. Uh, and incidentally, you know, we're not separate creations from, from, uh, from God. We are part of God itself. Well, that was blasphemy by that time. So um, for a very sad series of events that lasted actually all the way up to the extermination of the Cathar church in France in the 11 and 1200s. Uh, that was like the last swan song of, of the Gnostics. But Gnosticism has persisted in many forms and it keeps popping up. So you talked about the that Jesus then had the secret teachings or the mystical teachings that he only taught the disciples. What were the what were those things that he taught them? Well, essentially, if we look at the Gnostic Gospels uh, that were uh, largely, not all of them, but most of them were discovered in 1945. Incidentally, the same year the atomic bomb was created, and I think that's not a coincidence. But this wisdom came back to us in 1945 after thousands of years of suppression by the church. So we have a, we have a clue there. Um, one of the major things that he taught was that um, God manifests in two states, both male and female. And uh, he said in order to become, uh, uh, he said that when the male becomes the female and the female becomes the male and the two become one, then you will gain the kingdom of heaven. What, what, which is exactly what Carl Jung said. Carl Jung said, when we balance our male side and our feminine side, we become actualized human beings. We become superior and actualized human beings. That's why Carl Jung loved the Gnostics so much. Just an example of how they, kind of scooped him thousands of years before. And, uh, you know, again, uh, the, the teachings there were uh, that um, we are emanations from this one source, that we um, worked our way down in states of limitation to uh, where we are now, and that the way back to higher consciousness is essentially to trace our path back, number one, you know, to recognize um, what, uh, you know, what our origin was, and uh, work towards uh, attaining that higher consciousness so that the Jesus' original teachings were called the way. They were not called Christianity. Christianity was a term that came along quite a bit afterwards. And the original followers of Jesus would never have known what you meant when you said you're Christians. They were followers of, of the way. Now that's almost like yoga, right? It's like a, it's almost like a, 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 it's a spiritual tradition. It's a practice. And so essentially he was revealing 
um, different uh, elements of mysticism and practice to uh, the disciples and those people who are, you know, in that inner circle of how to attain higher consciousness. You also talk about the feminine path to higher consciousness. Can you talk about that? Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think, you know, each of us has the male and female aspects within us. It's called the anima and the animus, if you go by Jungian terms. And, uh, you know, each of us has those energies. So, you know, the male energy is more linear and uh, logical and analytical. The female energy tends to be more um, uh, more intuitive uh, feeling and, you know, from the heart rather than from the head. Now, we shouldn't mistake that to say all women are that way and all men are the other way because these things exist within both of us. So it's whatever really does predominate within you. And the lucky ones have a balance of, you know, have uh, have a balance of both of those faculties in there. But I really do believe that um, the feminine energy, the feminine faculty is kind of the gateway to higher consciousness because that's where you uh, start with, you know, your sort of intuitive feelings that there's something else out there that we are a part of. And you uh, follow those intuitive trails and you have those intuitive experiences. And then, you know, maybe you start to think about it logically, like how does this happen? Know, which is exactly what happened to me. Okay, I mean, my, my own personal history is, um, I found out early on that I was a very accurate medical intuitive. And then after I was able to overcome, you know, sort of like the, the disbelief of that, you know, it opened up the floodgates and I was, you know, experiencing remote viewing, psychometry, premonitions, um, you know, you name it just the way you said, I, I was, I, I, you know, I went through the full spectrum of it. Um, but um, the, 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 that it was really, I think, an intuitive factor in me that allowed that to happen. It was only later that I said, okay, being the Capricorn that I am, I want to understand the nuts and bolts behind this. So then I started studying mystical traditions and quantum physics. And the nexus there is that they both deal with life, both really at their core, both spirituality and quantum physics deal with light energy and consciousness. So that that's, you know, that that's it. But they're, they're both needed. I really believe they're both needed. And I, I, I liken it to a rocket, okay? So ro a rocket really has two components to it. It has the um, the fuel and the guidance system. Um, it you know the 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 fuel is really uh, the, the feminine or the spiritual aspect that allows you to get takeoff. But if you get takeoff and you have no guidance system, which is sort of the the male way of sort of organizing these experiences, you just go around in circles. Okay. If you if you have the guidance system without the energy, you never get off the ground in the first place. So that's why both of these faculties really need to work in unison. So now looking at the world the way it is today, what can people do to transform their life and 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 tune into that and become more male, female and intuitive and, and spiritual? Well, everybody's path is different, but I think the first thing is people have to have a desire <clears throat> to um, people have to have a desire to seek and to change because spiritual experience and conscious experience of higher consciousness, for the most part, usually is not something that falls into your lap. Okay, I was a little bit fortunate, kind of fell into my lap in a way. But, you know, I think with, with most people, it takes a, a little bit of work and, and effort. So I think the first thing you have to have is a desire. Now, that desire can happen in different ways. Sometimes it has to be hard like you got to hit the bottom of the barrel and your life gets so bad that you, you know, you just say, I can't take this anymore. I got to, you know, there's got to be something else out there and you start your path to seeking. Uh, other people may have a gentler path to that, but you have to have a desire to understand and to work towards a higher power. Now you can, you can have faith. Faith helps. Um, and I think faith to me is is like spirituality 101. It's a stepping stone. But you want to transcend faith because faith is really something that you take second or third hand from other people or other sources, whereas you want to have your own experience. The real goal, 
is to have your own experience with higher consciousness. It, get, it gets back to what I said before about fire. You know, we can either take it on faith from somebody else that fire burns, or you stick your hand in the fire and then you own it. Then you know, you, then you know what it is. So that's what you want to do. You might start off on faith as a provisional stepping stone, but you really want to get to the point in your practice, your meditation, your spiritual practice, where you actually start to have these extraordinary experiences with higher consciousness. And that's exactly what my new book, Quantum Spirituality, is about. It, 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 it really gives a wealth of knowledge from of, about all the things we've talked about, psychology, um, quantum physics, uh, other branches of science, and how they are coming together to show the same thing, to create an arena of knowledge to help people's um, bolster people's faith and, and their belief and give them the tools to start off on this uh, on this journey. And that's what it's really all about. But at the end of your journey, you want to become your own prophet, not to rely on somebody else, not to have to listen to me anymore. <laughs> that's good advice. Um, you also talk in the book about um, that all the disciples, that there was a female um, in the group of Jesus disciples. Can you talk about that? Well, really females, there were at least seven female disciples um, that we've been able to kind of uh, suss out there. And uh, but the primary one was Mary Magdalene. And we know this through the Gnostic Gospels that uh, Mary Magdalene was actually the primary disciple of Jesus. Uh, in fact, Peter, who in the Orthodox Bible is the primary disciple, was kind of pictured as a dunce. He didn't really get it. And uh and neither did most of the male disciples. So they didn't really understand the radical things that Jesus was teaching that was so out of whack with the Jewish law, uh, with the Jewish belief. And Mary Magdalene often had to restate what Jesus said in terms that these guys could understand. And he exalted her above, above all the others. He, he said, you know, you're the one who really is closest to the kingdom of heaven. You're the one who really gets it. And uh, it even has, um, you know, areas where it says he, he used to frequently kiss her on the mouth, um, which gave rise to some of the things that, you know, they were married. I don't know about that, but certainly Jesus was, uh, certainly Mary Magdalene um, was pictured as the primary disciple. Now, you also have that very interesting thing uh, in, in, in the Bible where um, the figure of Mary Magdalene in the Bible, it really feels to me like one of those um, classical paintings where the the artist painted over another painting and they, you know, they discover it modern times and they erase it. And you start to see the, the original picture around the edges. I really believe that she was erased out of the Bible at a later age when they started to move the women out of the church in order to become more acceptable to the Roman Empire. Um, and... Uh, you know, there's even a guy, his name is Ramon Giacino, and he wrote uh, a thesis uh, that was available on the internet uh, up until recently, at least, and that the Gospel of John was really the Gospel of Mary Magdalene. And of course, we have that very puzzling, um, you know, uh, Last Supper picture where, you know, John leaning against Jesus looks an awful lot like a woman, you know, uh, you know, which was popularized in the Dan Brown movies. And I think that's, uh, although I disagree with a lot of things that were in the Da Vinci Code, I think that's one thing that may have been right on the mark. So, yeah, I, I mean, I think there's great evidence out there that she was a very prominent figure uh, amongst the early movement of the way and that unfortunately she got written out of history um, with the other female disciples uh, when the uh, the patriarchal world of that time closed in on them. And do you have any um, memories of a past life? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I have uh, I have some pretty vivid memories of, of past life. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll, one I can share with you um, that uh, I was a doctor in the early 1900s and I was there around the rise of fascism in Italy. I was an Italian doctor and uh, I believe uh, I, was, I, I was killed by the fascists. For one thing, I was hiding Jews and, uh, and uh, I, you know, I, I was stabbed in the stomach and I knew, I saw where I lived. Uh, I saw that I had a home on the Vatican side of the Tiber River, that my street was via Virgilio Dorsini, and it was number 22, 
and it was the only home in the street that had a walk down uh stoop rather than was the, the 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 entrance was flush to the street and um it was so vivid that i went and i got a map and sure enough right there a few blocks away from the vatican said the dome of saint peter's which i could see was via virgilio dorsini that kind of a strange name to come out of the woodwork but i don't know i didn't know who the hell virgilio dorsini was before but that was the and so i, I was so intrigued that when uh, I went, I took a boat cruise, and when we landed in Italy on a terribly rainy day, uh, I ran down over there, and I went to the street, and sure enough, there was number 22, and it was the only one that had the, the steps walking down. Every other one on the street was flushed to the sidewalk, and I waited out there in the rain for almost an hour to see if anybody might come out to know the history of people that lived in the building. Well, it was a bad day, and nobody came out, but I did walk up, and I looked in the mailbox, and it was a medical building. They were all doctors. So, uh, you know, I mean, you tell me, is that how many coincidence, coincidences is that? Right. I mean, did you see that in the meditation or a dream or just when you were awake or how did you get the information? You know what rebirthing is? What did you say? Do you know rebirthing? What? Rebirthing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's 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 basically a technique um, where you you breathe in a certain manner and then you kind of go into a, a relaxed state. And that and, and that's how it came to me. I was I was actually in a um, uh, a group with about I don't know f half a dozen other people doing past life regressions. Right. No, it's fascinating. I have memories too from and found uh, then did the research and sure enough it was all true. Uh, yeah. And it's fascinating because it just shows that we we come back. We I mean we recycle this soul or this spirit keeps coming back. We must think this is just the greatest thing to be here on earth well ho hopefully for me this is my last time around i want to go somewhere else so <laughs> right i hear you uh i mean it's very you know it's very heavy here on earth too uh so my last question is what is the meaning of life well i think the meaning of life is to have the experience the full experience of what it means to be a human being, which would be, I guess, the pleasures and the sorrows, but ultimately the joy of understanding that you are not an isolated entity, but are connected to a wider universe and that you're experiencing that spectrum of energy or that spectrum of reality that, um, you know, a lot of spirits probably never really get to. So that, you know, if we all end up back in the same chorus around the throne of the source, you know, we were the ones that pioneered um, right, right out in the vanguard, right out in the fringes, kind of like, you know, back in the old Wild West days, you had those folks who were kind of all settled back East, but then you had those pioneers, you know, who went out there and braved all the, the dangers and everything else, you know, and had those experiences. Um, and they were rough and sometimes negative and sometimes you got killed and, and every, but you know, you did have, you were, you were right out there on the fringe. And I think that's what we are. You know, we're kind of, we're kind of that outer edge, that outer limit of experience. And uh, in a way, I hope we can go back and make that, um, you know, make something of that in, in, in the higher realms. Like I say, we are the bridge that is really here to, spiritualize the material and bring that experience back to spirit i think that's why we came here in the first place to experience something that we otherwise would not have been able to do love it and uh how can people find your book or learn more about you yeah um the best place to uh go to learn more about my work is my website petercanova.com that's p e t e r c a n o v a.com and i have written four books three of which are a trilogy called the first souls trilogy which is about the first spirit to incarnate into material existence and it traces their lives over different epochs of history um, the first book is called Pope Annalisa about an African nun who becomes the first female pope at a time when America and Iran are about to go into a nuclear war. And uh, that trilogy has won 25 national and international book awards. And then my latest work, Quantum Spirituality, 
uh, is my first nonfiction work. It's actually the 35 or 40 years of research that I put into all these things we're talking about that form the basis of the fictional trilogy. And I'm very happy to say that um, my publisher has entered it into a number of uh, book competitions. The first one just came back uh, a few weeks ago. It was the American Book Fest. They entered it in four categories and it won in all four categories. So um, yeah, it's, uh, uh, it, it's really... I, I would say it's kind of like a real tour de force of creation. It gives people a real A to Z um, immersion in uh, all things that would really help them on their spiritual journey and a path to experiencing higher consciousness. I can't wait to read those books too now, that the trilogy. So we're going to put the links in the podcast notes as well so people can easily find you. And I want to thank you so much for taking the time to be a guest today. It was a, a pleasure to have you as a guest. Well, thank you very much. I really enjoyed it. Thanks a lot. As we conclude this episode, I want to express my heartfelt gratitude for your presence within our community. If you haven't yet, make sure to subscribe, leave a review, and share this podcast with friends and family. Subscribe to my newsletter in the show notes and receive new podcast episodes delivered right to your inbox. If you resonate with the interconnectedness of mind, body, and soul and are motivated to embark on a journey of personal healing, I invite you to connect with me at drlaudi.com. Together, we can pave a path towards transformative healing in your own life.